Hello, welcome to the Fellowship of Faith <clears throat> Midweek Bible Study. We are here at our Madison campus. Thank you for tuning in tonight in our virtual world of Facebook and YouTube. If you don't mind, take out your devices and please click like and share. Please click like and share. And also, if you don't mind, uh, subscribe. If you are on <clears throat> YouTube, please go ahead and subscribe so you can receive the notifications. Once again, thank you. For tuning in tonight to our midweek Bible study, we are here at our Madison campus. We're getting ready to study, continue our study of 1 Samuel. And tonight we're studying 1 Samuel chapter 5. But before we get into the word, thank you for your loving gifts, contributions towards the fellowship of faith. If you don't mind, thank you for giving via GiveLify and PayPal. Once again, thank you for giving via GiveLify and PayPal. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, as we get ready to study your anointed word, I ask that you will anoint our ears to hear. And as your word go forth, as Paul says, may it have free course. May you be glorified. May the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, just as you spoke to Samuel and spoke through Samuel. <clears throat> I ask that you will speak to me and speak through me. And as you said in 1 Samuel, that the word of God was precious. I know it meant rare, but may the word of God be precious to us. May we fall in love with you and your word. And as our theme says, may Jesus be exalted and may your word be explained. And again, cause us to be thirsty and hungry and cause us to grow in your word, faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word. And it is faith that pleases you. So tonight, again, speak prophetically through me and to me to be a blessing to your people. And again, cause us to be built up in our inner man through your word. First Samuel, First Samuel, we're in chapter 5. This is lesson number 5, I believe, of our study through First Samuel. And I hope you are enjoying this study. Thank you, media ministry. We'll do 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, but the exposition will come through verses 1 through 12. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. And when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house or the temple of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they rose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Notice this derivative of the ark of the Lord signifying Jehovah. And the head of Dagon was, and both the palms of his hands were cut off between the threshold. Upon the st only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that came into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod. Unto this day. Once again, Father, as your word go forth, give clarity. Be with my mind as I think and my tongue as I talk. In Jesus' name, <clears throat> amen. From 1 Samuel chapter 5, we can clearly see this battle between the supremacy of God and the insufficiency of idol worship. So God versus Dagon or Dagon versus God. And here is my thesis statement. Here is my thesis statement. God always wins. God always wins. Even when it seems like he's not winning, God always wins. I am thoroughly enjoying this study of 1 Samuel. And I hope you are as well. And I want to encourage you to read through 1 Samuel in the Message Bible, NIV Bible, or different translations other than the King James as we study through 1 Samuel in the King James. Read it through another different translation. Last, on Sunday, we saw the stolen ark. In chapter 4, the emphasis was upon the ark of the covenant as it was stolen by the Philistines. 
Their problem was they called the ark an it, like we refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. The ark of the covenant was not an it or is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a symbol. It is symbolic. It represents the presence of the living God. The Ark of the Covenant was the visible presence of the invisible God, the Ark of the Covenant. It was made by Moses with acacia wood and overlaid with gold. The Ark is symbolic in that, or it is significant in that it is listed over 200 times in the Bible. That's a great hermeneutical footnote because whenever you see something listed that many times in the Bible, it is important. And in chapter 4, we saw that the Ark of the Covenant, or a derivative thereof, was listed 12 times in chapter 4, again, signifying the importance of the Ark, the presence of God, the visible presence of the invisible God. Again, once again, this is very clear or significant, the ark was a symbol of the presence of God, a symbol. The ark was a box, but make sure you get this now. The ark was a box, but God can't be boxed in. And you must understand that God is bigger than the ark. As I was studying this, I was reminded of Indiana Jones and the raiders of the lost ark. Israel worshiped the ark. When they should have worshipped God. The Philistines believed in superstition more than they believe in the revelation of God. Many believers are like that. They believe more in superstition than the revelation of God. We learned in chapter 4 that God will not be used like a rabbit's foot or a lucky charm. Israel, in chapter 4, they, they didn't pray, they didn't fast. But they expected the box to deliver them. But listen to me, a box can't deliver you. Only God can deliver you. God is not a rabbit's foot or a lucky charm. He's God. They treated the Ark of the Covenant like it was some type of divine mascot. They, they, they treated God like he was a genie in a box or in a bottle. They tried in chapter 4, they tried to fight in the flesh. They, they were defeated two times by the Philistines. The first time, about 400 soldiers were killed. The second time, over 4,000 were killed. They tried to fight, especially the first time, they tried to fight without God. Lord, have mercy. Then they say, after the Philistines defeated them, they say, let's go and get God. They say, let's go fetch the Ark of the Covenant. And that's how many people are in life. They they, they, they do life. They, they try to do life in the flesh. They try to do life without God. And then when they feel defeated, they say, God, let's go get God. But God can't be used like a genie in a bottle. He, he can't be used like a rabbit's foot. He can't be used like a four-leaf clover. He, more importantly, he wants to have a relationship with you. Four things I want you to see from 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5. Number one, the ark captured. Verse 1 summarizes what happened in chapter 4. The Philistines took the ark. They captured the ark as a trophy that Dagon defeated God. Lord, have mercy. They, they say in verse 1, we have the trophy. We have the ark of the covenant to prove that Dagon defeated God. Point to remember, God is always victorious, even when it seems like he's defeated. Verse 1, they surmise that Dagon was superior to God. They thought in verse 1 that Jehovah was dead and buried in the temple of Dagon. So number one, the ark captured. Number two, I mean, verse two, we see Dagon defeated. In verse two, they, they take the Ark of the Covenant to the temple of Dagon, again, as a trophy that God was defeated by Dagon. They place the Ark by Dagon. 
Dagon was an idol god of the Philistines. He had the head of a man and the body of a fish, kind of like a, a male mermaid, if you will. Dagon was a fertility god. But in verse 2, we see the Philistines celebrating that Dagon has won. Dagon has defeated God. In verse 3, it's just Dagon and God. Something happened overnight. Watch the text. Notice the emphasis or play on words with early in the morning. You know, a Baptist preacher loved that. Early in the morning. Early in the morning, the next day, when the people of Ashdod went to the temple of Dagon, watch what happens. They saw Dagon fell on his face before the all. It's a picture of Dagon worshiping God, a picture of worship on his face. So the people of Ashdod pick Dagon up and place him back on his throne. I don't know about you, church, but... I don't want a God that I have to pick up. I want a God that can pick me up. Can I get a witness here? In verse 4, again, notice the, the phrase, the ark of the Lord, signifying Jehovah. I'm sure in verse 4 that they thought an earthquake or some pranksters came into the temple and not Dagon over. But no, this is a classic case of the supremacy of God. Notice in verse 1 and 2, the author of Samuel makes sure that the reader understands whose hand the ark was in or who, who was in control of the ark. Verse 1, the Philistines brought. Verse 2, the Philistines brought. Verse 1, verse 2, they set it up. The author wants us to think that the Philistines were in control. No, their God Dagon, the, the, the author wants us to think that Dagon had won. But no, God is in control. Day number two, day number one, Dagon fell. Day number two in verse four, on the next day again, the emphasis is upon early in the morning. Something happened that night. Again, it's God and Dagon. They are alone in the temple. They go to the next day, they go to the temple of Dagon, and watch this. They notice that Dagon had fallen yet again. Lord, have mercy. Now, now, remember now, Dagon has home court advantage or home field advantage. Watch what verse 4 says. Dagon was falling upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Not only was Dagon, had he failed, watch this. They noticed that Dagon's head and his hands were cut off. As verse 4 says, only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Dagon's hand represents power. The hand of God represents power. Dagon's head represents wisdom. So this is a comparison between Dagon and God. Come on, talk to me, church. There is no comparison. God's wisdom versus Dagon's wisdom. God's power versus Dagon's power. There is no comparison. Look at the text. Dagon can't think because he has no head. Dagon can't hold you. Why? Because he has no hands. There is no comparison between Dagon and God. Watch this. God flipped the script because in verse 1 and 2, the God who was humiliated is now exalted, and the God who is exalted is now humiliated. God versus Dagon, the temple of Dagon, has become now the temple of God. The message is God is greater than any human power. God is greater than any idol God. The supremacy of God versus the insufficiency of idolatry. Speaking of idolatry and idol worship, idol worship is more than just statues. Dagon was a statue. 
Idolatry is more than just a statue. It's about full commitment. Let me ask you, who or what are you committed to? Who do you give devotion to? The idol of money? The idol of pleasure, even the idol of ministry, anything short of the living God giving devotion to the living God is idolatry. Leaning, a, a leaning Lord versus a loving, living God. The, 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 the supremacy of God versus the insufficiency of idolatry. In verse 5, no one, not even the priests, from Dagon's church, would go near the temple of Dagon. They, they treated Dagon's temple as if it was holy ground. It became a shrine, a museum. Look at the text. Until this day. Moreover, I'm talking about the fellowship of faith now. This is not a shrine to a dead God. This is a sanctuary to a living God. Can I get a witness here? The people of Ashdod, you would have thought they would have learned by seeing these acts of God. They saw two acts of God. Dagon failed the first time. He failed again the second time. But the second time, his head and hands were cut off. You would have thought that the people of Ashdod would have repented and worshipped God. You would have thought that a revival took place. But instead of a revival taking place, a ritual took place. They, instead of in the temple, them worshiping God, they turned the temple into a shrine, a museum. Instead of a revival, it was a ritual. Listen to me, church. The response to miracles is always to cause us to know God. Instead of them knowing God and worshiping God, watch the following verses of the text. They experienced the judgment of God. So number two, Dagon defeated. Number three, I'm in verse six. We see the Philistines terrified. Verse six uses metaphorical language. It talks about the hand of God. Notice it talks about the heavy hand of God. That is very significant because in chapter uh, four, chapter three, when uh, 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 um, the baby boy was born, uh, uh, Ichabod. When Ichabod was born, Ichabod means the glory of God had departed. Ichabod, the glory deals with the heaviness of God. It, it, it was stated that the glory of God had departed. But really, the glory of God has not departed. We see it on display in chapter 5, the Heavy hand of God, signifying the glory of God. Verse 6, but the hand of God was heavy. That's a play on words with the glory. Was heavy upon them of Ashdod. Now, again, this, this is a, not only is a play on words with the glory of God, the word heavy hand is a play on words with Dagon. Because remember, Dagon's hands were cut off. Listen to me, church. You don't want to experience the heavy hand of God. That's the judgment of God. In the text, they, 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 they had plagues of rats and hemorrhoids. Again, instead of them repenting, they sent the ark to Gath. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, the people of Ashdod decided they no longer wanted the ark in their midst. They didn't want the ark. The, 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 the presence of God is twofold. The presence of God will either drive you or it will draw you. They didn't want to deal with the presence of God. It was as if now the ark goes on a tour in the land of the Philistines. Five cities. The, tour, the, the, the ark goes to five cities within the land of the Philistines. They, they, they didn't want the ark in Ashdod. The people of Ashdod say, God hath defeated us, verse, verse 7, and defeated Dagon. Isn't it interesting that in verse 7, we see them defending Dagon. I don't know about you, church, but I don't want a God that I have to defend. 
I want a God that can defend me. Somebody say amen right there. In verse 8, they convene and they ask, what shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? Their response should have been, what shall we do with the ark? Their response should have been, repent. Their response should have been to worship. But instead, they say, let's take the ark to Gath. In verse 9, again, we see the hand of God, the judgment of God. And how they responded to the ark. They experienced the judgment of God in the form of destruction and hemorrhoids. Look at the text, in secret places. Use your imagination on that because Dagon was the god of fertility and now they have hemorrhoids in secret places. Again, use your imagination on that. God has a great sense of humor, doesn't he? Gath didn't want the ark because, again, the, the ark will either, the presence of God will either drive you or draw you. In verse 10, they sent the ark to Ekron. And the Ekronites, verse 10, look at it, they have brought the ark of God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. They too didn't want the ark in Ekron. So in verse 11, the Ekronites convene and they said, send the ark of God away, of, of, of Israel away. Let it go anywhere so it will not kill us and our people. Watch what he says, verse 11. The hand of God was very heavy there. Then the text closes in verse 12 by saying, And the men died, not smitten with the emeralds, and their cry of the city went to heaven. They experienced the judgment of God. Their cry goes up to heaven. Again, they should have repented. They should have worshipped. But instead, they experience the judgment of God. Let's review. Let's review. Number one, we saw the ark captured. Number two, we saw Dagon defeated. Number three, we saw the Philistines terrified. They didn't want the ark. The ark goes on a five-city tour within the Philistines. I'm closing. Number four, we see God Glorified. Remember I told you that you can see Jesus in the Old Testament? Well, right here in chapter 5, there are a lot of types and shadows in this chapter. You can see Jesus in chapter 5. Remember I told you in chapter 4, don't look at Samuel and, and, and Eli. Don't, don't, don't look at Hophni and Phinehas. Don't, don't look at the Ark of the Covenant. I want you to see Jesus. Well, likewise, in chapter 5, don't, 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 don't look at all these different cities. Don't look at Dagon. I want you to see Jesus. Watch this now. Types and shadows. The Ark was captured. You remember in the New Testament, one Friday, Jesus was captured. In, 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 in chapter 5, they, they, they put the ark in the temple of Dagon. Well, you remember? They, they, they put Jesus in the temple of death. Uh huh. They, 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 they put him in Joseph's borrowed tomb. They thought Dagon defeated God. Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord, in, in the New Testament, they thought the devil defeated Jesus. The text plays uh, 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 on words with early in the morning. Early in the morning, the people of Ashdod got up. Well, early on Sunday morning, Jesus got up. Dagon fell in the presence of God. Listen to me, church. Every idol uh -huh, falls in the presence of Jesus. In fact, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. I'm closing. What, 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 what Dagon or idol God needs to fall in your life? What are you giving devotion to? Again, this, this text is it's about the supremacy of God and the insufficiency of idol gods. Lord, have mercy. This story 
It's not about idolatry as much as it is victory. God gives us victory. He's always victorious. Even when it seems like he's losing or even when it seems like we're losing, we win because we have victory in Jesus. God's sovereignty. You can see God's sovereignty in this text. As, he, as God allowed the ark to be captured, that was God's sovereignty. You can see God's supremacy in that he, was, he is greater than Dagon. You can see God's sovereignty. You can see God's supremacy. But also, finally, you can see God's sufficiency. The people of Ashdod had to pick up Dagon. They, they tried to defend Dagon, but the God we serve, come on, talk to me. We don't have to pick him up. He picks us up. We don't have to defend him. He defends us. The sufficiency of God. He can take care of himself, and guess what? He'll take care of you and I. If you don't mind, put those hands together and give him some praise. Father, we thank you for your word on tonight. You're always victorious. Even when it seems like the enemy is winning, it seemed like the Dagon had won. But oh no, they woke up, Dagon had fallen in the face of the Lord. And Father, we thank you that all of our enemies, all of those idol gods have to bow down at your feet and confess you are Lord. Father, we thank you for being Lord in our lives, the sovereignty, supremacy, and sufficiency. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, if you enjoyed this message, please go ahead and click like and share. Please click like and share. Help us to spread this word evangelistically. And I hope you are enjoying this study through 1 Samuel. See you Sunday morning in Fellowship of Faith. Once again, thank you for your loving, loyal contributions of, of the tithes and offerings via GiveLify and PayPal. See you Sunday morning and be blessed.